All right, right-hander Paul Skeens, um, I want to ask, pitch by pitch, I want to go upbringing, right? So El Toro, I want to go LSU and all that, but we talked about it for a minute yesterday. Chicken Alfredo, every day, or every start day before. What makes a good chicken Alfredo? What makes a bad chicken Alfredo to Paul Skeens? Yeah, so I tried making it one time, and it was kind of a disaster. So I'm, I made it with my girlfriend before an outing and just put it, put it right in, like, straight into the container put the top on it and, and stuck it in the fridge which can't is do like it. a big no-no can't yeah. do it so uh i mean to be honest like don't have the chef yet so i always get it off doordash or, or from somewhere so um as long as it's not like separated and all that kind of thing i don't need a whole lot i just, I just that would be nice when is the chef coming first full year in the big leagues i have no idea i that's something i've been thinking about um I don't know. The nice thing is, in the big leagues, you got a chef with the team. So, looking forward to that. One hundred percent. We got a good one in uh, in Indy as well. Um, Paul, obviously, I want to walk through you know fastball, slider, and, and what you're working on now, sinker, changeup, and all that. But at the beginning, you know, we we talked about it briefly during media day. El Toro High School. I think you'd be the fourth major leaguer to come out of El Toro. Two of them have platinum gloves in Nolan and, and Matt Chapman. Have you met either of those guys? Are either of those guys? kind of presences in your baseball experience yeah uh definitely people i've looked up to i've met matt in passing i honestly can't remember if i've ever met nolan but um i i believe i used to hit with his dad and i i, I know his little brother pretty well yeah. um uh romine i want to say he caught a bullpen of mine okay um probably when I was like a sophomore, junior in high school. It's, it's just cool to, you know, cross paths with them. Yeah, we talked a little bit about your, you know, kind of matchups with Jared Jones, and you were glued to the TV watching Jones' second big league start. And, you know, Southern California, obvious hotbed. Who'd you grow up playing travel ball with? Were there any, you know, notable names that, you know, you are, hey, I played with this guy when we were 10 years old. He was hitting nukes, and he was the first kid to hit puberty. Any guy like that? Um, guys that I played with. Or against. Jonesy. Yeah, for sure. I play. I've played against him since we were probably twelve or thirteen, uh, and I don't remember if he. I don't know if he remembers all that. The guys I've played with. We have a bunch of guys in pro ball right now that I, that were on my travel ball team. Um, couple guys in double A, I think, but uh, nobody has made it yet. Got you. Um, the decision to go from El Toro to the Air Force Academy, and obviously, there's a lot of written stuff and a lot of video stuff out there about that. But um, you know, it, it's fascinating to read about your mindset about this whole thing and I love the kind of precursor that you say this is what I want to pursue for now because it seems like you have a lot of different directions you want your life to go and you know you've got an idea for life after baseball so what really went into the decision I know you've got military background of the family what went into your decision to go to the Air Force Academy yeah so I, I mean I was good in high school but it, it wasn't like um I'm going brag. I was good in high school. No, like, <laughs> it, it, I mean, I wasn't, I'll, I'll say I wasn't as good as Jared Jones Got in you. high school. I wasn't gotcha. good enough to get drafted out of out of uh, high school. So, and I knew that. Um, I just hadn't grown into my body and that kind of thing yet. So, um, the more, like, real thing for me was uh, flying jets and doing cool stuff. Yeah. And, you know, ser serving my country. Like, that, that, was, that was really cool. A cool idea. Yeah. Um, and kind of started growing in my body, and I, I committed as a catcher. I wasn't even pitching when I committed. So. Okay, so i I got to cut you off there because Arm Leighton, my co-host, tweeted out a video of you gunning down a guy when you were at the Air Force Academy, and I was like, nobody that big should be getting in the crouch. Why did you choose catcher? Like, you had to always be a big kid. I, I was big, but it, it, I wasn't, like, always the biggest. Um, yeah, I mean, probably when I was 13 or 14, that's when guys started getting bigger than me, so – um like I was always a, a tall kid but like and I just threw the the gear on at some point when I was eight or nine or ten years old and it just stuck and then I've been catching longer than I've been pitching man when did you really start diving into pitching as something that you could become obsessed with because you know obviously all the best whether they be in the major leagues whether they be in college whether they be in the minor leagues they're all obsessed to a point and that's what pushes them further than the draft pick than the first round pick when did you really see pitching as something that you could become obsessed with yeah so I mean the, the way I view pretty much everything is if I'm going to do something I should do it right yeah and that's how I saw catching that's how I saw you know obviously see pitching now hitting everything school everything I've right 
I've kind of done. Um, and got to credit the parents for that one. But um, yeah, it was like, I remember probably my junior year, um, just had a good arm. Yeah. Um, and someone on the team had a pocket radar. One of the parents on the team had a pocket radar. So we were, you know, playing in fall games, just, you know, screwing around. And um, and it was just like, you know, I'm just going to go out there. Wasn't throwing bullpens or anything. Wasn't doing anything mechanical. I was just going to go out there and, tr- and see how hard I could throw it. And I had a, I had a good change up because uh, that was when I did pitch when I was like 10 years. And I, yeah. I, I should say, like, I, it's pitching is not something that I've, like, just picked up in the last four right. years or something. Yeah. Like, I have been doing it my whole life. Yeah but not seriously so right. um but yeah and so I've always always had a change up I don't even remember what the breaking pitch was back then but um yeah I was just gonna go out there and try to throw the ball as hard as I could and then figured out like all right now I'm, we got some mechanic like not that I'm moving poorly by any means but we got some mechanical stuff that we can do hold on you what know. did what did we hit on the pocket radar I mean it, it was like probably every every two weeks might be a dramatic or every month might be dramatic but it was just like you know steady okay. increases and I remember I was a reliever my junior year didn't throw any bullpens yeah. it, it kind of reminds me of my freshman year at Air Force I, I did throw bullpens there but yeah. um it was just kind of going out there and having fun and because the primary goal was to catch um and so I was a reliever closer whatever my my junior year of, of high school and we make it to the second round of our, you know, like CIF champions, yeah. district, whatever, because yeah. uh, we don't do state championships in California. Um, and they're like, all right, we need you to start. And I'm like, let's okay. do it. Yeah. And I think the hardest I had thrown up to that point was like 88. And then that start I heard after that I hit 91. And nice. so that's like, and and for seven innings. And then um, I don't even remember if I picked up a ball for two weeks after that. I was pretty sore. <laughs> sure. All right. So it was junior year of high school that you hit 90 for the first time. When did you hit 100 for the first time? Uh, if you ask my Air Force coach, it was uh, it was my freshman year at Air Force, right. but I, I have a feeling it was my sophomore year. Gotcha. Um, or no, I hit, I hit 99 my sophomore year, so I think it was legit. I think it was uh, last year. Seriously? Yeah. Um, we were at Arizona. I closed out a game in Arizona um, like two or three weeks after we won at LSU, my first college series. But, um, yeah, Finished out a game at Arizona. Jay Johnson was the coach. Who yeah. Was, you know, coached at LSU last year. Um, and I finished it off, and then I go back in the dugout, and Kaz, our head coach, is like, hey, you hit 100. I'm like, no, I didn't, dude. Like, come on. And I hit it 98 before that. And uh, and he's like, no, you hit 100. So I'm like, okay. I guess it was like one scout in the stands had, had a gun that said 100. Everything if he, else was like 97. But if, hey. If one says 100, it says 100. So, yeah, stadium gun. It can say 105. Track man can say 100. But you hit 105. So Easy. I love yeah. it. Um, a lot has been written about your relationship with Jay Johnson, who's the head coach at, at LSU. Now you mentioned, you know, you played him at Arizona when you were at the Air Force Academy. But I'm curious about your relationship with Wes Johnson, who's now the head coach at, at Georgia. And he was – for one year, the pitching coach of the national champ. And it was such a a weird, to the outside perspective at least, it was such a weird move. It's like, why would the pitching coach of the Minnesota Twins become the pitching coach at a college program? Obviously, he parlayed it into a college head coaching job, and that's something that I know a lot of coaches really enjoy, and they like the layered approach to recruiting. And I mean, now the portal, like, you know, you could talk to different coaches, and they'll, they'll decide how they feel about the portal but obviously the portal was a great thing for you what was working with Wes like what cues did you learn from Wes that you know maybe you feel like you never would have picked up uh a lot um and it's it, working with him I like to say is like if you have a question about anything in the game um and I mean anything he either has the answer or he knows someone who has the answer and, and he'll figure it out he's not going to BS you and and give you something that isn't true or something like that which uh you know there are coaches out there that that'll do that which is unfortunate but um yeah it was just and and just the way he you know figured out my body knows how I move like everything yeah um there were you know there I went in there and and the you know the low hanging fruit was some mechanical stuff in my lower half um you know get bigger which isn't necessarily a pitching thing uh it's just and, a velo thing, right? And sustainability thing. Too. Yeah, like 
you know, nutrition, strength, conditioning, like there was, there were a number of things, but, um, definitely some really low hanging fruit when I, when I first got there with how my body was moving, you know, pitch design, that kind of thing. And then once we kind of figured that out, it was, it was actually really fun to, um, you know, get into the season and make some minute adjustments. Yeah. And he came to me, you know, like the fourth week of the season and he's like, Hey, I think you should start switching sides of the rubber. And hmm. I'm like, okay, I trust you and started <laughs> doing that. And, um, it's something I'm still doing, uh, like just, just little stuff like that. Got you. So all the punch outs rack up throughout the season, you get to Omaha and we were lucky. Arm got to sit down with Rhett Lauder in Arizona last month. And he asked Rhett about the matchup with you wake LSU trip to the championship series. And that was, I think everybody realized like gonna be an all time classic and it had the makings on paper. And like so many of those games don't live up to those expectations. And that lived up to the expectations and then some. And Arm got to ask Rhett was like, did you understand the gravity of that moment? Did you understand what you were a huge part of? And he was like, it was hard not to because, you know, LSU filled up is it TD Ameritrade, Charles Schwab, Charles Whatever, Schwab. I think, it, I think it's Charles Schwab. But LSU had, had filled that up. And I mean, Wake had some frenzy people there too. And, and Rhett was like, man, I'm, I'm feeling this. This is a big game. Did you feel the gravity of that moment too, or or was it one of those where you could tunnel vision that thing and you realized it after the fact? Yeah, so I'm that that's kind of the realizing after the fact is is kind of how I've realized that that I am. Um, I pitched in the first game of the College World Series against Tennessee and and you know threw well that kind of thing, and then I'm having guys come up to me after because that's double what we've pitched in front of it's like twenty five thousand versus twelve thousand and the box is a great environment but yeah it's, it's not omaha yeah it, it, it's just different and um so people are coming up to me you know teammates are coming up to me like hey how cool is it i'm like dude i'll tell you after this game today like i, I wasn't paying any attention to it and that's kind of how it was for me then um it's just like you know call it whatever but i think if you can simplify the game and make it about you know getting a really good game plan and then going out there and executing to the best of your ability, like win or lose, like that's all you can do. And that, that, was, that was kind of the focus. Um, and then once I came out of the game, it was, it was like not a, it wasn't a weight off my shoulders, but Thatcher Hurd was in the game. who's my roommate and, yeah. and who was my roommate. And, you know, we had kind of been through it together and I'm like, I, I full confidence, like I'm, I'm, I'm good with, with where we're at. And then, I love that. You know, Dylan and Tommy in the in the eleventh inning or whatever it was. But oh um yeah, I, big game, but we 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 knew what the outcome was going to be before it was. I love that. And Thatcher was dealing with injury for the majority of that year too. So it's it's been good to uh I guess see him healthy this year, right? He's been he's been healthy and going for, for you guys too. So um all right, that takes you to the draft process. I haven't really read much about the the quote unquote big three going into that draft and it really took until like 10 minutes before the pick came in that anybody knew that you were going 1-1. It was like, it was Dylan, it was Dylan, it was Dylan, and then all of a sudden it was Lankford. And then it was Skeets. And that was fun and exhilarating for the baseball fan. What inklings did you have? Like, when did you really find out? You said you got a call, I think, 10 minutes before the pick came in, so you found out like right when everybody else did. But did you have any idea? Like, what what was the process like for the the five days to a week before the draft. Yeah, so we, we won the College World Series, I think, 13 days before the draft. I think we won on a Monday, and then uh, the draft was on two, two Sundays following. So um, they gave me basically like five or six days to, you know, get all my affairs in Baton Rouge in order, move out. Your you affairs know, in order, everything. yeah. Yeah, <laughs> um, and then I, you know, went home to California, and then I started the meetings with the clubs, basically a – I don't even know how long process, you know, crammed into a week. So, um, and they, you know, they like to keep their, you know, uh-huh. hold their cards close. Like, so they, they weren't giving me anything. I, I felt good about the interviews and that kind of thing, but I was just kind of like, whatever, like yeah. no matter what happens, it's, it's, it's going to turn out well. And obviously I'd been with Dylan. I played with Langford over the summer. Yeah. Uh, Freak for team way. USA. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, hit the two farthest balls in, uh, Charles Schwab field history against yeah. us so that was tough but um yeah I didn't I didn't know what to expect I, I wasn't super worried about it because I I just thought that it was gonna or I knew that that no matter what happened it was going to end well um but yeah it was just it was, it was obviously cool I think I got a call probably 15 
10 or 15 minutes before the the actual pick and so that was that was cool i mean really about as easy of a a draft process as it could have been that is awesome all right so you you jump into pro ball um i want to go pitch by pitch just kind of rapid fire to to wrap but before that i've heard so much about your preparation and you know I, i was talking to Miggy yesterday after you started on friday i was talking to him on saturday your manager here in indianapolis and you know he said you've already got names so i'm sure you're already aware that justin henry malloy does not swing the bat like things like that so you've got you've got those names down can you walk me through you know mentally what boxes you're checking and physically what boxes you're checking in between starts so you start on friday what happens before you tentatively start thursday yeah um i i I like to take a full day off at least on a six-day program um because because of how long the season is um and really you know the season's long the off season's long too yeah. like and and the thing that I want I hope people understand is that everybody in the clubhouse works really really freaking hard yes. to to you know go out there and do what they do so um yeah just take a, a day really for physical uh recovery mental recovery to check out is, is kind of the bigger thing for me yeah. um but yeah I mean it, it you know uh, strength conditioning, uh, training room, nutrition's huge. Like every, everything adds up. Um, even if it's a 1% difference, that's, you know, that's a 1% difference that can go up or down. So, sure. um, that's kind of, kind of the way I look at it. And, um, game planning probably starts, probably starts tomorrow, to be honest. That's um, right. Monday. So yeah, bullpen Tuesday this week. Um, yeah, just, just getting ready to, and and I don't I don't finish all that until I'm ready mentally and, yep. and physically to to go out there and compete. Hundred percent. All right. Uh, fastball. Big thing is the velo. Everybody can see that when they're watching a game, when they're listening to a game. And you know the the book on Paul Skeens before he starts is you know oh he throws 101. The thing that may be craziest to the baseball purists that I've seen is what was it, 122nd pitch of the night last year at LSU it was 102 in in the regional holy shit man like how do you do that like my big question when it comes to your heater is what have you done to sustain velocity that deep into a game yeah so like I said the offseason's long um and and my theory on it is is building workload and and building volume of a body so um I I think you go I that's something I've always been able to do and I think not not you know to that extent but you know if I'm topping it at 88 I'm going to hit close to 88 at, at the end of the game. Is, is, and that's something that I take pride in. Yeah. Um, is it a lower half thing? Like, what are you thinking as the game goes on, or is it just something that is entirely natural? I'm, I'm throwing every pitch as hard as I can, I'll be honest. Gotcha. Um, exactly. and, I, and, I, and I think it's, it's, you know, strength conditioning, nutrition, yeah. uh, you know, everything. And um, I think part of it might be catching. Part of it might be going to Air Force and, you know, running around and doing all that crap yeah um but i think like bottom bottom line it's you just got to work for it um and that you know that's something i take pride in and and is is a focus of the off season and during the season just building workload and, and getting ready to you know handle that load that's really cool to hear um i know what occasional two seam but for the most part it's four seam um how often are you throwing with like a wrap soda are you worried about spin efficiency and invert what are you looking for numerically if anything that that's a cue with your fastball yeah i think i mean so i'm uh there are a lot of guys that can get um that that look at the the data yeah. a lot and, and, and there's some data darlings i mean ty floyd your lsu teammate who's like what 20 inches of vert all the time no, he's, he's a unicorn fastball he's a freak fastball. yeah and for a guy like him the velo doesn't even matter to be honest so um, and, and there's a number of factors that go into that that you probably can't see from the stands unless you have the, you know, the iPad there, right. um, or you're a, you know, guy who's been around the game for 20 years, yeah. but, um, yeah, like, you know, guys can get paralyzed by the, the analytics of it. So, um, that's something I, you know, I try to toe that line, uh, awesome. cause there's definitely, and, uh, you know, especially as you go up in levels, more data gets thrown at you. Oh my God, yeah. Um, so you got to kind of learn to filter that out and that kind of thing. But um, every every bullpen you throw, obviously every pitch in the game, every pitch in the game has Hawkeye and track, track man. Every bullpen you throw has track man. Right. Um, 
and it's just but i think the biggest thing is what the hitters are are, are telling you um that they're taking good swings bad takes you know obviously swing and miss like all that stuff um and then if you aren't getting swing and miss or um you know you aren't getting bad takes that kind of thing then you can look at that and that kind of shows you it, it, it should be able to show you like why that might be happening yeah makes sense um slider for you i know uh spring breakout people saw some interesting shapes and in that too and i i talked to you for a minute about it and, and you said yeah you, you'll manipulate it and you know, you've got one of those like baby cut guys, and then you know you were throwing more of a sweeper type at LSU. How many different iterations of your slider are you rolling with? Is it is it cutter ish slider, and then something in between, or or is there one that you know you're even experimenting with? Yeah, I mean it's it's one grip that I either stay behind or get get on the outside of it a little bit more, um, and I try to manipulate that. Yeah. Uh, depending on the situation, hitter, that kind of thing. Um, if I need a strike or if I need a swing and miss, that kind of thing. Gotcha. It's that, you know, um, it's it's all feel. And so it's just, again, the the data, you know, a 20-inch sweeper is cool right. on, on track, man, but is it going to get a ton of swing and miss? Like, who knows? Right. Um, the hitters the hitters need to tell you that. So, um, But it, it's, it's one grip, and I'll throw it, you know, some of them – move arm side some of them sweep 15 16 inches something like that so it, so it's a 20 inches of sweep that get like the baseball podcast guys going because it's like oh we can quantify that we know that we can compare it to other guys but i'm sure it's it's all results oriented for you too yeah i mean it's objective um yeah. and the you know the 15 16 inch sweepers are the ones that are going to end up on youtube and pitching yeah. ninja and all that kind of thing but um yeah bottom line is is you know getting outs getting strikeouts and getting quick outs like everything and all that adds up 100 percent. third pitch it's been you know sinker splinker type right in the in the 94 95 range um i know you're throwing a change up in like the high 80s at lsu i want to say um how is that third pitch kind of transformed are you you know working on integrating change up and having that sinker what's what's your approach to the third pitch yeah so the it was the same i mean call it whatever you want uh Worked on getting a sinker at LSU. I didn't throw a sinker before I got to LSU. And through it all fall, we couldn't really throw it during the season last year, frankly. Um, it, was, it wasn't really a bad speed pitch, but like that was kind of the pitch that, especially since sinkers are more right-handed, right, you know, same side hitters. Yeah. Um, we just couldn't really throw it last year. So a goal after the – and it was, it was really good in the fall when, cool. frankly, we had hitters that could – hit it or that that could you know hit the four seam and, yeah. and it made them choose shape of the fastball so um that, that is a refreshing thing about getting a pro ball is, is <laughs> frankly getting guys that can hit hit, hit meters um but yeah so it was a true sinker at, at lsu and it was it was inconsistent at times mixed it in occasionally during the season but i threw it a ton in the fall and the winter which you know nobody sees um but then i got to i i, I was throwing it between the college world series and when i reported to bradenton after the draft and literally just threw one and i felt it uh come off my index finger and i and I, I split it a little bit um a lot of guys throw sinkers with their fingers together and uh and so i threw one and i felt it come off my index finger and i was like okay. and, it, and it was filthy yeah um and i was like okay i'll i'll just try to keep doing that and then you know kept the, i threw it against guys in in pro ball when I, you know, got to FCL, low A, all that yeah. last year, and then up to double A, um, and then kept throwing it over the off season. And, and that was really when it's like, we, we started looking at the, the edge video and we're looking at the, the metrics of it. And they're like, they're, they're basically um, telling me like, we don't know what to classify this as. We don't know how to grade it. Right. Like, it's just, it's, not a pitch that we haven't seen, but it doesn't. It's not a traditional sinker. Right. And I'm like, okay, well, let's look at the edge video. And it's coming. It's it's not splitting my fingers, but it's it's very close to it. Got gotcha. so, um, and it's a low spin pitch. It's right. you know tumbling all that. Um, so, so you could say like, hey, the Duran guy in Minnesota does it. I guess we'll call it a splinker. Yeah, but he throws his a lot harder. <laughs> he um, his like 102. <laughs> yeah, uh, and so henry davis was catching me and he was like all right let's call it a splinker i'm like okay dude call it whatever you want like let's just get outs with it so um yeah it makes it in 100 percent um one of the fun things that um and i bring this up with a lot of guys that could be labeled as supinators right you got your pronators and your supinators um walker bueller who we had on every week when he was recovering from tj 
um, you know, he is a supinator, true and true. And he was like, I just got to find a way to kill Spin. I got to find a way. And he was 2,500 RPM fastball. And he found, you know, a, a change slash split-ish type thing that, you know, dropped him down to 1,400, 1,500. So was it simply you wanted to find a way to kill Spin? Or was it like, you know what, this works and this can be a pitch that I throw, if need be, 30 times in an outing? Yeah, so I don't, I don't really look at it as killing Spin. I don't, I don't look at Spin rate a ton. I don't look at uh, axis, tilt. Nice, you know, efficiency. I, I just don't look at it a ton, frankly, because I don't understand a lot of it. Like in my mind, I'm like, <laughs> yeah. okay, if a guy has a 2500 fastball, he should be riding at 18 inches, For sure. but he's only riding at 12. Like, what's the de- and like that stuff doesn't make sense to me. So, um, you know, I, I kind of I look at the end shape of it. I mean, uh, I was talking with our, our data guy at LSU, yeah, about Alex Lang, and he's like, yeah, he has a sub or he had a, tw- a sub 2100 curveball. That was like the best pitch in college baseball. I'm like, okay. How does screw work? this screw this spin yeah. stuff like i don't care if the, if, if the pitch plays it plays um and i was just like the with the developing the uh, sinker splinker whatever it was purely just an eye thing an eye and feel thing i'm like okay as long as you know the, my eyes are telling me that it's good the feel is telling me that it's good and then the you know the data is, sh- is showing me that it's good it's a good pitch and then yeah. now it's just a matter of getting it against hitters and hopefully they show me it's a good pitch Hundred percent. A couple more for you, real quick. Guys that you grew up wanting to pitch like, or guys that you grew up wanting to hit like. You know, we talked about it. You are a uh, right now a Pirates baseball junkie because the bandwidth just isn't really there to to ingest baseball in a league wide thing. But I'm sure when you were a kid, it was like, I want to be Ken Griffey Jr. or somebody like that. Who did you want to be on the hitting side? And you know, you watched the pitcher and and you said, I want to be like that when I grow up. On the hitting side, um, when Otani debuted, I mean, he's lefty, but, but. that was the big thing for the two way two two way thing, yeah. Especially when I got to college, um, wa- you know, watched him a lot when I was a junior in high school. Probably is when he debuted um, at Angel Stadium. Um, hitters, I I honestly don't remember. I know sure. that there were there were plenty of guys. I just don't remember. Hundred percent pitching wise, who would you who would you look at and say that guy's nasty? I want to look that level of nasty. He does something that you know I really want to try doing. Yeah, so I grew up watching Jared Weaver, and he's super, super crossfire, and that's not something. And I'm, I'm kind of the same way. And I didn't, I didn't, you know, when I started pitching, I wasn't like, okay, I'm going to be a crossfire righty that you know pitches like Jared Weaver. It, it just kind of happened. That's just kind of how my body moves. Um, but he kind of showed me like, okay, because you know when you're 10, pitching coaches are going to tell you to you know stride toward exactly. the catcher and. Like okay, you know whatever. I'm just gonna and, do and my those thing. are the perfect mechanics. And like by the book, you don't have the perfect mechanics, but you've got the thing that works for you. Yeah, it's different. It, it's it's perfect for me, I think. Um, but yeah, I mean, and then you know, recently, obviously, grew up watching Verlander, Scherzer. Yeah. Um, really enjoy watching Kershaw compete, even though it's a com- just about the exact opposite of what I do. He's a lefty north south guy, and I'm a righty east west guy. But. Um, yeah, and and you know now Strider, Wheeler, right? Um, LSU connection, Nola, Gosman, just love watching them compete, and hopefully can you know take some stuff from them. Hundred percent, Paul Skeens. Last one for you. Um, you're in AAA right now. You're knocking on the door of you know what what everybody hopes is a long and very very fruitful career. What are you looking to do on a start by start basis in AAA to say? To convince yourself. And, like, I bet you're already convinced that you're going to get out to the big leagues. Al, dude, like, everybody on social media is already convinced that you're going to get out to the big leagues. But for you to feel entirely comfortable with who you are as a pitcher before you get there, what boxes are you trying to check internally? Um, face a face a lineup more than one one time for sure. Um, but the – and that's kind of the big one. Obviously, that's that's what you have to do as a starting pitcher. Um, and it, it like, like you said about the – the 120 pitches thing like um it's tough to do over you know three innings I got asked about that you know your last pitch of your outing was 100 101 whatever is your 50th pitch and I'm like yeah I threw 44 pitches like yeah I hope so (laughs) um and so that that, to be honest that's something that hopefully I can check that box when I get to the big leagues because hopefully that's soon (laughs) um but yeah and, and and the plan that I'm going to have for myself aside from just getting the hitters out and attacking their weaknesses that's going to change on a weekly basis and um that's going to be kind of a man in the mirror thing like okay now you know 
did I accomplish what I wanted to today, whether the results are good or not. And, you know, the, the people on the stands and on social media, whether they, you know, however good they think the outing was, I'm probably going to think differently. And, um, cause it's not a stuff thing. It's not a competitiveness thing. It's a, um, frankly, just an execution thing. So, um, just executing to the best of my ability, whatever that is on, on that day. Paul Skeens, this was awesome, man. Thanks for coming on. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it.